morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to San Diego. The weather is beautiful down here. And I'm from the Bay Area, you know, just a couple hour flight and it's like 40 degrees warmer, uh, in particular in the summer down here, but it's amazing. Uh, we have a great three days uh, for all of you this week. Uh, Open Source Summit and the uh, Embedded Linux Conference is a great event. Uh, there's so many different people here from different projects and communities. Uh, one of the things I encourage all of you to do is really try and talk to somebody who may be working on a technology or a project that you're not necessarily familiar with. And I'm gonna show you in a minute why that's important, but I think that's one of the best parts about an event like this is you have such a broad representation of people who are working in technologies that may be adjacent to each other, but might not actually know each other that well. But before I get started, I of course want to thank our sponsors. First I want to thank our diamond sponsor, Intel. Let's give them a round of applause. Our platinum sponsors, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, Google, IBM, and Red Hat. Let's give them a round of applause. But most importantly, I want to thank the chairs and program committees for uh, doing all the work trying to sort through all the different talks and choosing uh, the ones that they thought would be best for this particular event. It's a lot of work uh, and uh, these folks do it so well. Uh, I won't go through and read every single name here, but I think I went through this this morning. I think I know all of you. And again, I just want to thank every single one of the folks who do all this work. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Uh, please visit our sponsor showcase as well. Without the showcase, we can't do events like this. And there is a lot of cool things down there. I was checking it out yesterday when they were setting it up. It's on the fourth floor in the Sapphire Ballroom. So go down and check it out. Uh, food and beverage is also located. Uh, the meeting and lounge spaces and developer lounge are all down there, the sandbox. So go check it out. Uh, also, Please check out uh, the schedule uh, on the go so you can visit the schedule by using a QR code on the back of your badges or just go to the website URL located there. Uh, a few other things that I wanted to uh, mention is some of the diversity and inclusion initiatives that we have uh, this week. Uh, today we're hosting a women in open source lunch at 1255 at the Vela restaurant. Uh, if you haven't signed up already for that, please do. Uh, and we also have on Thursday a speed mentoring program at 2.20 p.m. Uh, that is on the uh, elevation on floor 30. So uh, also, if you haven't uh, done that, haven't registered, please do that now. Uh, I also uh, want to do a quick reminder about our code of conduct. Uh, it's prominently displayed. Any of our staffs can refer you to it, uh, but essentially all uh, attendees should be feel welcomed and included uh, at this event. If you have any questions at all, uh, please contact any of the people wearing a staff badge or a shirt, uh, and they will be able to help you out as well. So with those uh, housekeeping notes, I thought I would kick off uh, this uh, year's event with a cool video about uh, an open source project here at the Linux Foundation. So let's just roll this quick video before we get started. Every single part of the filmmaking process is touched by software. And a lot of that software is open source software. The Academy Software Foundation exists to provide a great home for open source projects that we as an industry use every day.
user of open source software or an engineer or a company that relies on open source software, we want to create the right ecosystem for you to get the most out of the open source software that you need to use. Find us at aswf.io and join the mailing list and see how you can get involved. How cool is that? I'll tell you, 16 years ago, if you had asked me if an open source project would have Spider-Man, Iron Man, uh, Rob Rita, who's the president of Industrial Light and Magic and is the chairman of the Academy Software Foundation, uh, was nominated for a visual effects Oscar this year. Uh, it's just uh, amazing, and uh, the Academy Software Foundation, uh, if you haven't uh, heard about it or uh, are interested at all in the visual effects industry or the film industry, it, it's one to check out. Uh, I, I will say without necessarily, I mean, maybe I will pick on a few other projects, none of our projects have uh, a real uh, that cool, like, not even, well, I, maybe, so Linux has got the penguin, so cute, right? People recognize it, that's cool. Um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has FIPI. How many here know the F FIPI and friends? So this is a very cute set of uh, mascots. So okay, they're kind of trying to keep up with the Academy Software Foundation. And then our networking group has this really cool uh, mascot. <laughs> Very complex architectural diagram. They get it, it's their thing, okay. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, the, the cool thing is no matter whether it's networking, uh, the Linux kernel project, Cloud Native Computing Foundation with projects like Kubernetes and many, many more, uh, or the film industry with the Academy Software Foundation, you know, open source is really pushing uh, innovation uh, just beyond software into whole, all sorts of different uh, areas in tech. Uh, and I was talking the other day with uh, John Corbett, who's the uh, editor of Linux Weekly News. If you like Linux and you want a good source of news, Linux Weekly News is definitely a good one. And John was saying to me, like, you know, there's so many different projects at the Linux Foundation. You seem to be announcing new ones all the time, but you never actually talk about the method to that madness. And you know, folks wanna know like what's going on at the Linux Foundation, kind of why are you doing what you're doing? And uh, I told them like, well, one of the reasons for that is the first rule uh, at the Linux Foundation is don't talk about the Linux Foundation. Uh, meaning like we'd like to talk about the developers who work on our projects, we like to talk about the projects themselves. I think they speak for what we do with all the amazing outcomes, whether it's in the automotive uh, sector or in embedded Linux or so forth. But I thought I would spend a few minutes today forcibly, kind of almost painfully talking about sort of where the Linux Foundation has been and where we're going so that I can give all of you a little bit of context uh, and then finish by announcing a few more projects that, a couple more projects that are joining the Linux Foundation family this week. So, as you all know, by our name, the Linux Foundation started out as uh, a home for Linus Torvalds and as an organization uh, that I often characterize uh, just does the, the janitorial work for uh, what is just the, one of the greatest uh, projects uh, and collaborative innovation uh, efforts in the world. And by janitorial work, I mean, you know, we're there to keep the infrastructure running that enables that great in investment. Uh, we're there to host events like this. You know, the original Open Source Summit was actually a Linux event where the whole idea was, hey, let's get these developers and this community together in person because we bet in a couple of hours we can reduce the uh, email traffic on LKML by an order of magnitude just by letting people resolve differences face to face. We also work on providing uh, a legal uh, framework of uh, managing trademarks, of uh, helping to make sure that the intellectual property that the world is investing in and depending on is reliable and something that people can count on. So that's kind of how we got started and that's uh, not everything we do, but that's a decent summary of kind of how we uh, began. Well, what happened next is we started then seeing uh, communities sort of jump up 
right around Linux, whether it's projects like Yocto, which is an embedded build tool. How many people here work on the Yocto project? So quite a few of you, right? We're at the Embedded Linux event. You know, Yocto started off, uh, Yocto came out of uh, Intel and some other technologies that were uh, in that area. I see Dave Stewart right there, who was one of the very early people working on that. Uh, and has now grown to be really a de facto way that people build uh, custom uh, Linux uh, systems. Uh, carrier grade Linux was another one that came out of the telecommunications industry. So this kind of started going. So these were things that were kind of adjacent to Linux and we started using kind of the tools and methodologies of what we were doing in those areas. And then along came new projects, this time in the networking sector. So Open Daylight came along back when Software-defined networking was in somewhat early days, and the telecommunications industry was taking all of the hardware that they were using to run their global networks, abstracting that into software, and then managing that virtually. And at the time, an SDN controller like Open Daylight was a critical part of that transformation of these global networks. And so we worked with a huge set of stakeholders to build an open source project that would create a free uh, open source controller that the industry could leverage, and they do to this day. That's when things started getting a little bit crazy. And more and more organizations and wholesale industries started coming to the foundation saying, we like what you're doing in terms of helping these communities grow, enabling these brilliant developers to create amazing innovation outcomes, building wholesale new markets around new categories of computing. Uh, and we started doing that in a huge way. You know, you just saw the Academy Software Foundation. We spent two years with the film industry and the Academy uh, Motion Picture Arts and Science. Uh, convincing them and showing them how to participate, how to share their intellectual property, how to collaborate as a community so that they could open source all of the projects you saw on that reel uh, and enable essentially more visually appealing and compelling film experiences for all of us. In the automotive sector, We've worked with now, I think, a dozen of the top automotive manufacturers in the world who are now using automotive-grade Linux in production in millions of vehicles to create that in-vehicle software experience that, you know, back when we started it, wasn't the top reason someone bought a car. People bought cars because of the color or gas mileage or the body of the car. Today, software is one of the top reasons why people pick one vehicle over the other. And when the auto industry knew that they needed to create a ton of software to enable their vehicles to have a rich experience, they chose open source and they worked with us to go tackle that particular effort. Many people here this week are working uh, on next generation vehicles and lots of cool technology. And the best part about it is it's all open source in that particular project. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, is one of the hottest projects uh, going right now. Uh, and what I would remind all of you of is that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation isn't even that old. How, how old is CNCF now? Four, four years? I'm getting to four years right there. Uh, it was started based on an initial contribution from Google with the uh, Kubernetes project. Uh, has obviously grown to many more projects. But the thing there is, the work in open source was just part of the effort. I see there's a lot of folks here uh, from CNCF in the audience, and I remember having conversations with many of you back then saying, you know, the real goal of this is not only to build technology and to enable Kubernetes to succeed, but to move the entire industry to a new way of deploying and uh, developing, deploying, and managing software, this sort of container microservices approach using you know, DevOps rapid methodology uh, back then was a new thing and, and has become wildly successful. Uh, I think there are over 450 members of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation today, thousands and thousands of developers. We're gonna be back here in November in San Diego and we're spec expecting I think over 10,000 people uh, here for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation event uh, in November. So if you need a hotel room, you better sign up right now uh, to get to that event. 
We even kind of started going beyond open source projects into things like Let's Encrypt, which is both an open source project and an actual service. How many people here know Let's Encrypt? Oh, that's awesome. When we first started talking about Let's Encrypt, it was not that many people. But essentially, Let's Encrypt is the world's largest certificate authority. The idea here was if we could make HTTPS, if we could provide free TLS certificates to everyone, all of our security and privacy on the internet would be better. That if you build everyone up collectively to have secure ways of communicating, that would be better for society. And that has knocked it out of the park. Is there anyone here who works on the Lex Encrypt project in the audience? There's a couple people back there. This is just amazing work. Uh, it, it has done so, so well. TARS is another example of an RPC framework out of China, where we have projects coming in from other regions of the world using really innovative technology at high scale. And we're not just uh, stopping at these initiatives, we're now pushing even further. And this year what you've seen is a move from not just open source, but also into open standards and open specifications. What we've realized over time is that in order to enable some of the open source implementations that are important to our projects and to all the people in our ecosystem, uh, we also need to have specifications and standardization to enable that interoperability or consistency in many cases. GraphQL is a great recent example of a project that has come to the Linux Foundation and is Really, if you, if you haven't checked out GraphQL, this is an incredibly important project. Go check it out on the GraphQL website. We also have open specifications with implementation. OCI, the Open Container Initiative, is not only a container specification, but it also provides a legal framework so that people know that when they implement that specification that they have intellectual property that they're confident and can trust. And then, uh, we recently announced the Joint Development Foundation. The Joint Development Foundation is an organization under the Linux Foundation focused on very quick and straightforward open standards initiatives. This is essentially taking the rapid innovation you see in open source and bringing it to the world of standards. Now I know this is a very open source uh, friendly room and what I hear often from open source people is criticisms that, oh, you know, the problem with standards that we hate standards, they take too long and, you know, we don't need standards, we're just gonna implement it in the code. Uh, and then of course the standards people, I won't repeat what they say because this is really much more of uh, open source crowd. But what, what is very clear is that you do actually need both, and what the Linux Foundation is hoping to bring to the table through JDF is a more rapid way to do standards development that enhances and is interlocked with open source development so that we can have the best of both worlds. But we're not just stopping there. Uh, recently, we've also delved into open hardware. How many people here know RISC-V? So, of course, we're at the embedded Linux uh, events. <laughs> Most of the events I go to don't know that maybe as well, but it's an instruction set, an open instruction set. Uh, this is an amazingly fast-growing project under the uh, Linux Foundation. We also announced this year the Chips Alliance. It's an open hardware design project. Uh, if you haven't checked out the Chips Alliance, I think this is something worth uh, checking out as well. And we have a few more uh, open hardware projects uh, that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But we're not even stopping there. So what you're seeing here is you've got open source projects at every layer of the stack from the OpenJS Foundation, which has things like Node.js and a lot of JavaScript projects, all the way down to infrastructure, Linux kernel, down to firmware, hardware. Uh, you know, just at every gamut of the stack. That, combined with open standards, creates better, faster, open innovation. And the next generation of projects that we're starting to see emerge evolve around now open data. So open data is now something that we're really seeing is another new generation of open source-like projects that are important to all of us. 
In particular, as we see the need for data in uh, use cases around machine learning and other uh, things that make the world better for us, we need better ways, just like open source licensing uh, for code, to license and share data. So one of the things the Linux Foundation uh, did was, was we created an open data license agreement. It's just two agreements that enable people to share and organizations to share data. Uh, one is uh, an Apache-like sort of permissive license. The one is more of a GPL-like uh, restrictive share back license. You can choose based on whatever requirements you have. But what this does is provides a consistent way for people to license data sets to enable better interoperability or better sharing, more importantly, uh, amongst those uh, data sets. We've also created something called datapractices.org, which is a set of best practices around how to actually uh, share data. And we've even partnered with uh, wholesale industries, in this case with our LF Energy Initiative, to be able to share data inside of specific industry groups, in this case the utilities, so that we can enable that data to be used to lower your power bill, to fight climate change, and to produce a smarter uh, distribution of energy that all of us can use. And so that's sort of been the evolution of the Linux Foundation in terms of how we've participated in open innovation and how what started with and continues to be uh, the most important open source project in the world with Linux has expanded beyond Linux to other layers of the stack in terms of open source, to standards, to open data, to open hardware, and we will see even more. And with that, I have a couple of new projects uh, at the Linux Foundation that we are announcing this week. Uh, the first project I wanna talk about uh, comes back to the concept of uh, privacy and security. And that project is the Confidential Computing Consortium. Uh, the Confidential Computing Consortium is, uh, has been created to accelerate the adoption of essentially confidential computing, which is uh, a form of encrypting not data at rest, not data in transit, but actually data in use. Uh, and we have an amazing set of organizations that are backing this. Uh, from Intel to IBM to Red Hat to Microsoft uh, to Alibaba and many, many more. Uh, and today I want to bring out uh, two people who are participating in this effort from two organizations that are actually contributing projects this week to the Confidential Computing uh, Foundation. Uh, let's first bring out Lori Weigel, the VP of Architecture, Graphics, Software, and General Manager of Platform Security at Intel. <laughs> Welcome. Please give her a hand. And John Gossman, Distinguished Engineer, Architect from Microsoft to learn more about this. Welcome, John. Hey, Jim. All right. Why don't we come over here and have a seat? So how many people here are aware of the concept of confidential computing or securing data in use? Mostly the front row. Mostly the front <laughs> row. Okay, yeah. we've got some reporters here. Uh, we've got some deep technologists, uh, Microsoft employees and Intel employees, so there you go. But, you know, confidential computing is an important concept, and I'd like to, to start off uh, if you one of you two, maybe I'll start with John, could explain, g give us the primer. Okay. What is confidential computing? So I think the easiest way to, to explain this term, and I think it's interesting that so few people uh, uh, are familiar with even this crowd, is an indication of how new it is, is to think about our own data uh, as users of the web or commerce or social network. What do we care about? that data. Obviously we care about it being secure. We don't want you know, hackers to get on and use it against us. And we also care about privacy. So, and this is something we're, I think we're all much more aware of than we maybe in the past was this concept of privacy. So the, that first word, confidential, is covering the fact that we care both about security and, and privacy. And then if you think about then with that data, you expect that the connection to the server is going to be securely, the network is connected. You just, don't, you take that for granted mostly now. That, and that, that data also, you hope that whoever gets your data 
is going to encrypt it at rest on the disk so that it's, right. again, uh, both secure and private. But I think we also know that at some point, some sort of an algorithm is going to have to do something with that data. And if it's just completely an opaque encrypted blob, you're kind of in problem. So the context of complex computing, as you alluded to in the introduction, is that we can actually keep the data encrypted while programs are working on it. And this turns out to have you know, just an enormous wealth of, uh, of scenarios it could support. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Laurie, your group has done probably the, some of the most research in the world on uh, this concept of confidential computing. And give us a little bit more depth on this concept of a secure enclave and how it works, because I think that helps people understand uh, what it actually is. Sure. So for a few years now, we have had a capability built into Intel processors, or some Intel processors, called Software Guard Extensions. And that provides a hardware-based capability for protecting an area of memory that you could think of as a trusted execution environment. So as John mentioned, in that trusted execution environment, the hardware protections are there for both the data as well as the code. And if you think about it as we're moving more and more into artificial intelligence, people care about the privacy of the data, but they're also increasingly concerned about protecting their algorithms. Uh, because a lot of times that's where the intellectual property is. So this whole concept of confidential computing and trusted execution environments can be used for both of those things. Yeah, yeah. So John, Microsoft is contributing an SDK uh, this week to the Confidential Computing Consortium, um, and I assume that's to let more developers be able to access this technology, but what, what was the decision making and, and what's behind this uh, effort to open source that? Sure, so uh, I don't think I probably have to sell the merits of open source to too many people yeah. in this, You're uh, at the right event. this room. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the Open Enclave SDK is designed to make it easier. This is, you know, as Lori alluded to, it started out as hardware instructions at the very, uh, on, on the silicon and kind of builds up from there. Well, that's a pretty low level uh, API that most developers would you have to be prefer super to get smart like Lori beyond to figure that quickly. Out. <laughs> and so uh, with the Open Enclave uh, SDK and along with some of the other um, contributions other people are, are bringing to the, to the consortium, it's to make it easier. It's just like anything. This is middleware. This is the next level, provides application portability, makes it uh, easier to write applications that run across both devices, cloud, and, uh, and raise up that level of abstraction. Um, and also bake in some, you know, some patterns, because one of the things, again, with security software is you want to get the tricky bits right, and you want to have as many eyes and, and people looking at that and figuring it, making sure that that's correct as possible. Yeah. Well, tell me about why, why, the, why the time is right now, sort of the state. You know, I see a lot of big names uh, up there, but what is kind of the state of the art of you know, academic research and industry adoption of this? Like, what, why this particular project now? So we felt in particular that this was a, the perfect time to do this because the technology, the concepts have been out there long enough that we're seeing a lot of traction in the research community. For Intel SGX specifically, we have more than 200 academic papers that have been published. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of our ecosystem partners beginning to invest in this space. And so it's a really great time to bring those efforts together so that we don't end up with fragmentation and in fact, we have the best minds collaborating on moving this forward and making it easy for developers to access it. You know, we, we live in a world where a lot of times convenience and privacy are in tension with each other. And this is a capability that has the promise of letting us have it all. But we do need to co cooperate and collaborate to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, so uh, one question I'd like to ask both of you is, I think some people are here are familiar with sort of secure enclaves to be used for like authentication or something mm -hmm. like that. But you've both been thinking about a lot of different use cases beyond things like that. T tell, tell the folks about some of the examples of how this particular technology might be utilized. Yeah, so some of the early work that we're seeing um, happen right now that is probably the most interesting is uh, collaboration between institutions on very sensitive information like healthcare data. So think about the innovation and uh, 
the new discoveries can that can happen if the data can be shared. But yes, this is the very, very most sensitive data. So this notion of multi-party compute and being able to use confidential computing and data protections to enable that sharing is going to unleash a lot of innovation. Yeah, and you know, as I was talking earlier, you can see all these things all linked together in terms of there's how you license the data. There's safe ways to then share that data without disclosing it to others. All this stuff starts to come together, which it would be great for, for all of us. John, how about you? What are you seeing out there? No, what she said is the fascinating thing is you think of it first of all, like, like I said with networking, you think of it as security and privacy. But then you start thinking about, well, if you've got this place where you can compute on data, now you can have uh, with transactions that are joint transactions between parties that don't entirely necessarily trust each other, or do, they certainly don't want to leak that data from one place to another and work together. You know, obviously there's a lot of getting that chain of trust in the code and adjust the code in order to make sure that that is all working. But this is an incredible enabling technology, and I just think we haven't even really scratched the surface on what the scenarios for this are. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would encourage all of you, if you work for an organization that cares about this, to go and check out the Confidential Computing Consortium. If you want to go get the SDK and uh, check it out. Uh, if you want to read some of the 200 papers that Lori's <laughs> organization <laughs> has painstakingly published, uh, go check those out as well. But we're really excited about this particular effort. We do think it's something that can improve the privacy and security of all of us. So, Thank you both for being here, and we look forward Thank to you. great things. Thank you. Thanks for having us. But we are not stopping there. We've got another open hardware uh, initiative. Uh, so this week, we also announced that the Open Power Foundation is becoming uh, a part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, this is a community that is enabling innovation on the power architecture. Uh, and here to discuss it with us is uh, Ken King, the GM of power from IBM. Ken, come on up. Thank you. I see, uh, I see Lori tried to trip you as you were walking out on stage there. Oh, now, now, that we're, now that we're good friends and we're talking about that, I think that we'll have to fix that. We've got plenty of room for innovation uh, for everyone. Tell us about what's going on in Open Power. Yeah, we're real excited. Uh, we, we let the news out yesterday, even though we're officially putting the uh, press release on the wire today. And we've already got a lot of great press and analyst uh, stories written about it. The, the community is excited. We've got endorsements from a number of different players. But basically what we're doing is um, we're taking the, we, we've seen what's been happening in the industry, right, with all the, the move towards big data, data explosion, AI, et cetera, and the need for greater levels of performance uh, in the system, not just the processor, but yep. in the system. Yep. And you look at some of the challenges going on at the processor with Moore's Law and other things, we've seen through the Open Power Foundation work over the last five years the need to drive much greater levels of integration with the accelerators, with the storage, with the memory, et cetera. And we've been doing that, and we've been driving that innovation. But we realized, as we see things going on with the Open Compute Project, things going on with um, you know, other new open source ISAs that are coming out, yeah. and even others like hyperscalers and other players that are actually hiring chip designers and creating their own accelerators, their own capabilities to address that performance, that there is a need in the industry to take the openness of power to the next level. And that's what we've announced. Yep. We're taking the instruction set. We are now licensing it to the Open Power Foundation such that anybody can implement on top of it royalty-free with patent rights. Great. So now anybody can implement any kind of open capability, hardware capability on top of it without any concerns about what that means. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of great feedback on that. We're also taking that to a level of open governance, which is where our relationship is, yep. is growing, which is... Now the instruction set architecture can be enhanced, extended, added to, based on an open model. So the, there will be an open governance workshop in the open power, work group, not workshop, yep. work group in the Open Power Foundation yep. that will be the voting body for determining whether anybody's extension can be approved. And it just needs a majority yep. vote for that. IBM gets one vote. Yep. So it is now an open governance model for adding and extending to the ISA, which is exciting as well, and it just reinforces the point of this is really an open model. Yeah. Secondly, we are contributing to the community um, our RTL and, and open source for 
our open CAPI and open memory interface, which are coherent accelerator and memory interface standards yep. that we're now putting in the community. Yep. And we're looking to work with other communities like CXL and others to drive convergence to create truly an, a, a common open standard for those acceleration and I.O. and memory interface capabilities. So we're excited about that as well. Um, and then last but not least is we are taking the Open Power Foundation and we're putting it, it's staying with its own membership and, yep. and board and everything and its normal policies, but it'll be a part of the Linux Foundation. Yeah. And we see that as a, as a message to the marketplace. Linux Foundation is one of the leading, if not the leading, open source community and body in the industry. And having the Open Power Foundation as part of that is a statement to the industry that this is truly an open model. Yeah. Um, we had, you know, we have had great response just in the 24 hours or so. I'm getting LinkedIn requests like crazy Good. for people that want to collaborate. I won't know the naming names and companies <laughs> and so forth. But, um, you know, we really see this as a, as a great way to really open up the hardware side of, of the industry. Yeah, and what's interesting is, you know, at events like this, we get a lot of requests for uh, matchmaking, essentially, with chip designers and hardware folks and software people because you know we're seeing more and more from different organizations or different users of tech you know the need for more hardware acceleration more custom hardware acceleration for again you know machine learning and the kind of compute yep. uh, intensive uh, applications that are emerging in the market now so we are psyched to have you uh, on board and, and very happy to be uh, working with the Open Power Foundation and hope for uh, many great things to come from it. We look forward to it. All right, thanks. Good partnership. Man. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we just have a couple more uh, announcements uh, to share. Uh, first, uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, again, back here in November, book your hotel rooms now, that's gonna be sold out. Uh, but they have added 49 new uh, end user members, including GoDaddy, LinkedIn, Vodafone. So now there are over 100 end user organizations that are members of this particular effort. This is an important thing to look at because it really shows that the technology is becoming mainstream and widely adopted. Uh, our Open Mainframe project uh, is announcing new members uh, and a Zowie conformance program. Uh, so if you are a part of that particular effort, go check out the uh, Open Mainframe project as well. I have one final thing that I want to do today, uh, and that is to recognize someone in our community uh, that has made a significant contribution uh, to this sort of story about open source and standards and sharing uh, that I've been talking about. How many people here know the SPDX project, the Software Package Data Exchange Project? So this is essentially a standardized way to share a software bill of materials across a supply chain. As open source becomes fundamental to all technology products and services, and as the dependencies and complexities of that grows with hundreds and thousands of packages in any product or service, the need for the industry to track what is actually in every technology, product, and service down to the package, version number, license, and so forth was recognized years ago as a problem that would come to fore. Uh, and in order to meet that challenge, the Linux Foundation and lots of passionate folks from the legal industry who wanted to track license compliance and intellectual property across that supply chain got together to figure out a good way to do it. And as you can imagine, when lawyers and engineers get into a room together, great things happen every single time. <laughs> Why, what's so funny? All right. But um, one of the people who really led this uh, was an attorney uh, who's now uh, an attorney at Canonical, but her name is Jelaine Lovejoy. Uh, Jelaine has spent countless hours since 2009 working on the SDPDX project, uh, working to make sure that the requirements of a very complex uh, specification of a very complex software supply chain uh, could happen. And really, you know, one of the, the gifts that Jelaine really has is building a bridge between 
legal minds and software minds, which is a true, true gift. So as part of that, we want to recognize Jelaine Lovejoy by giving her an award today to honor her for her service in the legal community. Is Jelaine, where is Jelaine? Can Jelaine please come up on stage? Somebody's pointing, is she? Where, oh, there she is. Oh my, yeah. Jelaine, here's your award. Thank you. I've known you for a long time. You yeah. have. Uh, <laughs> thankless hours, so much work. Uh, I have seen you so patiently explain legal concepts. <laughs> It, it almost repeating yourself over and over. Okay, one more time. Let's talk about <laughs> rule of law. Uh, but you've done an amazing job, and we really want to thank you. Let's give Jelaine a huge round of applause. For all of you. Thank you. Can we get a picture right here? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, now introduce our first speaker.